So, the machines are part of our team. How many Cylons are in the room? Okay, all the nerds, you just expose yourselves. If you, if you got that joke, you are definitely a nerd. So, how many people recognize this place? Yeah, right, this is Metacomet Mill on the Anamon Street in Fall River. So, I grew up in Fall River, and on my way to school every day, I'd pass by this place, and I was a little kid, and you know, this was a textile printing mill. I'm not sure exactly um, when it stopped print being a textile printing mill. It may still be, for all I know. I'm sorry I'm that ignorant to that. But I remember as a kid hearing the machines and just knowing, you know, I, I probably don't want to go work in that place. Um, you know, because you know, my, my mom actually worked um, in a, uh, a leather factory, a uh, leather goods factory. And I got, I got to know that, you know, it wasn't really the most pleasant environment. But I, I definitely got the sense that when machines were moving, stuff was happening. That human productivity was somehow influenced by this machinery. And as a little kid, I didn't really understand the historical context for that. And then I went to this place. How many people know what this place is? Yeah. Go Corsairs. So I'm UMass Dartmouth alumni. It was Southeastern Massachusetts University when I started there in the early 90s. Before that, it was Southeastern Massachusetts Technical School. Has history going back to the textile education. And you see what's going on here. There's something about this area, Fall River, New Bedford, Dartmouth, and the textile industry, and really manufacturing in general. But again, as a kid, and even as a computer science student at UMass, I didn't really understand that historical context. So... Uh, I found myself working years later as a computer scientist and software engineer, and my machine of choice was now the computer. And of course, you don't really interact with the hardware a whole lot as a computer scientist. You build these machines that are sort of an intellectual thing, and, and your world is algorithms. But then I found myself in a pretty interesting place, um, working in this emerging field of Internet of Things, and it actually wasn't even called Internet of Things at the time. We called it machine to machine, and really it was just big, expensive, super complicated machinery like this that somebody needed to make sure it was working. And so if something went wrong with it, instead of sending a dude in a truck to roll out there and several hours later maybe find out that some part was needed, um, wouldn't it be cool if we could remotely troubleshoot and remotely diagnose the problem? So that was really one of the beginnings of Internet of Things. So this is, for anyone who doesn't recognize it, it's a strange looking thing. I hope you don't ever have to really recognize it. Um, but if you, if you know what it is, you know how important it is. It's a radiation therapy machine. And these machines are basically linear accelerators. That means inside of them, there's this part that's exciting electrons to create an ionized stream that can actually attack a malignant tumor and cancer cells. Um, you can imagine if you're a cancer patient, this is a pretty important part of your life. So, uh, obviously very important to keep these things running. Okay, let's talk a little bit, <laughs> so back to the basics of machines, of course the Berenstein Bears. <laughs> uh, when I think of machines, I think of the Berenstein Bears, here's why. There is this book, The Berenstein Bears Go to the Science Fair. And in that book, which I read when I was in preschool and kindergarten, um, it explained that a machine, the most simple of machines, are really just very, very simple tools. A lever is a machine. This windlass is a machine. So what does a machine do for us? It helps us manipulate our physical environment in the way that our muscles alone can't do it. Um, so it gives us mechanical advantage on the physical world. Um, and this is a really simple example. Um, you've, you're going to see a lot of wind turbines today. You've already seen them a bunch of times. Um, I want to point out that a wind turbine like, like one of these, the rotors, like one rotor blade, can be over 100 feet long. That means I'm reaching the back of this theater, one rotor blade, and it's a couple hundred feet up in the air. And at the tips, it's moving, the tip is moving at 180 miles an hour. So pretty intense machine and it looks simple and elegant to the going back to the theme of design here uh, it doesn't look so elegant in design when you look at it from this perspective but consider 
that the way the wind turbine is connected to our power grid is actually a rather elegant design. But it's got some problems, and we're going to get into that in a little while. Okay, so another revolution uh, in machinery is this. So I have physical prop. This is called a Raspberry Pi computer. It's a $35 computer. So if you remember back in the days when you were getting America Online discs, like the late 90s, early 2000s, at that time you had this giant tower box of your, that was your PC if you had a PC back then. This is like two to three times as powerful as that was back then for 30 bucks. So here's what's happening. This compute power, Moore's Law, we've all heard about that, it's happening and it's going inside of our machines. The machines are getting smarter. This, I can't even have a prop that shows you this at scale because you wouldn't see it. This is a sensor, it's a digital sensor. A sensor can find out something about the environment, the physical world, and turn that into a digital signal that a computer can understand. Okay, I'm giving you a bunch of concepts here. Keep them up, up in your brain for a little while. I'm gonna pull it all down to earth. Okay, so our machines now can be smarter. They can sense their world. That means they can start to know something about themselves. Not like sentience, like the Cylons, but they can, they can make some sense uh, of their own status and they could potentially communicate it. So let's talk about communication. History of human communication. We talk face to face, no problem. We have language. When I want to talk long distance, one of the earliest ways of doing remote communication was a signal fire. So if I'm the dude who's supposed to me in the castle and I'm up in the watchtower, I'm scanning the horizon because my buddies are miles away and when they see the enemy coming, they're going to light the signal fire. Primitive remote communication. Then we learned that, well, we discovered this stuff called electricity and we learned that these electrical impulses could be carried along copper lines and if we go tap, tap, tap over here, we get a bump, bump, bump on the other side and the telegraph was born revolutionized communication. We stretched these wires across the globe and people made lots of money going tap, tap, tap so they can send signals to each other. Then some even smarter people learned that these electrical signals can actually travel through the air and they're called radio waves. And if you suck the air out of a vacuum, out of a, uh, a piece of glass, you call it a vacuum tube. And a vacuum tube has this interesting property that it can detect these radio waves and even create them. And so radio was born. And now instead of just the tap, tap, taps, we can also send our voice long distance. Wicked cool stuff. And then of course, you know, I don't even have to talk about this slide. Cellular phones, they were in cars and bulky and now they're in our pocket. Okay, so these are our machines that can communicate, but they communicate so that we can communicate to each other, human to human. These are the new breed of Internet of Things devices, and this is the variety that you'd find in your home. So if you're a smart thermostat, it keeps you warm and comfy. Um, you can have your sprinkler system uh, tied into the, the weather system, so you can automatically turn on your sprinklers, use your smartphone to communicate from one thing to another. It's all wonderful stuff, it's comfortable, it makes our lives more convenient. Isn't that great? But there's another side of the Internet of Things. We call it the Industrial Internet of Things. And what the Industrial Internet of Things wants to do is solve some of the world's grand challenges. So watering my lawn is a convenient thing that I like, but it's not a grand challenge. But it could tie in with one. So let's talk about a grand challenge, and that is productivity in our factories, the stuff that makes the stuff. So you've all heard of the, the Industrial Revolution. Some people say there are four, and we're in the fourth now, and you could just think of, them as, think of it as four phases of the same revolution. The first phase was we learned how to use steam power to move heavy stuff, heavy stuff that our muscles and our, our earlier primitive machines couldn't do. And then we learned that if we made interchangeable parts, we could stamp out more stuff faster. That was a huge revolution. Then the computer and automation revolution happened just in the last couple of decades where we have industrial robots that can optimize the work done at a single part of the assembly line. And the fourth phase is what we're calling cyber physical systems, fancy sounding term. What it really means is the robots and the stuff that's making the stuff, it's all communicating. 
So the system, the factory as a system, is more coordinated. This is Tesla's factory, their current factory in Fremont, California. It was originally a joint owned factory, um, jointly owned by GM and Toyota. At the height of its peak production before Tesla bought it, um, it was pushing out about 500,000 vehicles a year. That was in 2009. Elon Musk bought it, painted it stark laboratory white, gutted the equipment, and made it a cyber physical system, an industry 4.0 style factory. And he thinks that they can push out a million cars, the same factory, in just a few years. So that's a 100% productivity increase. Um, does this mean that jobs aren't gonna leave the country? No, but it, what it does, it, it could. What it certainly means is that if we can be more productive about making our stuff, we're gonna spend less time doing stuff that's not productive. Uh, so these are power lines, obviously. Uh, here's how power works. Okay, we generate power at some place, a coal power plant or a nuclear plant or a wind farm, and the power has to, it has to be used. It has to be used when it's produced. So we transmit it to, over long distances over power lines. It ends up uh, at a transformer. From the transformer, which is probably in your neighborhood, and you know this because when a tree falls on the transformer and it blows up, you lose your power, right? That's because the last mile is what we call distribution. So this system, most of the power grid is over 40 years old. It's not very smart. It's what we call dumb, the dumb grid. We need to make this grid smart. And making it smart, part of what making it smart means letting your home and the everyday devices in your home, possibly like your thermostat, give a little intelligence back to the grid and say, hey, maybe you can predict, not just even predict, sense my real-time load in my home, what kind of power needs I need over the next hour, day, and modulate the distribution through the grid in a more effective way. And this would have the result of a more resilient power grid. So it's estimated that by 2050, our, our world agricultural output will have to increase by 70%. That's to accommodate the 9.6 billion people that are gonna be walking around the planet by then. So with industrial internet of things, we can sense wind speed uh, for uh, in, in an agricultural um, operation. We can know the real sunlight. Uh, today it's mostly based on predictive models that look back uh, the, the average sunlight at this time of year over the last decade is X. Well, with sensors, we can know exactly what's happening today. We can know exactly how much potassium, nitrates, phosphates are in the soil, what the soil's moisture level is in real time, and modulate the irrigation and fertilization of our, of our crops. Uh, another world population statistic is that by 2050, when we have 9.6 billion people, 6.3 billion of us will be living in cities. So how do we prevent our cities from being smog-filled parking lots? This is Singapore, and Singapore is instrumenting their city with thousands, tens of thousands of sensors. Sensors that will know every parking spot in the city. Sensors that will know when waste bins need to be emptied, not just because, not just drive around and take a look and, and see if the trash needs to be emptied, but actually know that the bin needs to be emptied. So as you can see, the theme here is optimization, making these systems more optimized. Uh, one more for you, this is, uh, you know, you talk about design. This is a waste treatment, a wastewater treatment, treatment plant. Design isn't always an aesthetic thing. Sometimes design can have beauty that's not um, immediately observed. And I, I actually think that a wastewater treatment plant is a beautiful design. Here's why. What happens in a plant like this is the wastewater, the effluent, is separated into solids, liquids, and gases. The liquids are cleaned and reused for irrigation. The solids are chemically treated so they can be safely disposed of at a landfill. And the gas, the methane, is used to power the plant, right? It's actually a very elegant and beautiful design, as long as it's working like a clock. And to work like a clock, 
the treatment needs to inject certain chemicals at different stages of the processing pipeline. And in order to know exactly which chemicals at exactly the right time in the right place, Industrial Internet of Things is helping the problem with sensors um, so that we can optimize our wastewater treatment. Okay, so bringing, bringing this all back to um, our radiation therapy machine example, it occurred to me uh, when I was, I, I was working with the product manufacturer that makes this linear accelerator, and their value proposition for IoT was to reduce the downtime of their equipment. But when you kind of zoom back out in your macro lens, really the endeavor here is to help a cancer patient receive her life-saving treatment. And if you are the family members, clinical staff, technicians, maintenance people who are helping with that endeavor, you're part of a team. The way I think of the Industrial Internet of Things in particular, it's as though we're making the machines part of our team. Because now that the machines are smart enough to know about themselves, they're smart enough to communicate about themselves, it's kind of like communicating with a team member. So it's not an antagonistic relationship we should have with these machines. It should be one of embracing them as team members. So yeah, I started talking about Fall River and UMass Dartmouth. There's really something about this area and the Internet of Things. In south coast of Massachusetts, in the greater Boston area, we have incredible, innovative technology companies, and we've got real-world, on-the-ground projects happening right here in this hood, where fishing vessels are being automatically scanned, their daily catches automatically scanned for biological or chemical threats. And our vineyards and tomato farms and micro greenhouses are instrumenting their, with soil sensors and moisture sensors so that we could be in the south coast of Massachusetts. 50 years from now, with climate change, it's happening, whether you like it or not. Um, believe it or not, this area could be the world's leading tomato and grape grower. And we can do that with Internet of Things technology to help us optimize. So profound impact on our culture, on our society, on, again, the grand challenges of our time. And we can take the most advantage of this technology and help if we can learn how to design for productivity, sustainability, and resiliency. Thank you.